Amen. 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 I think. Uh, is, yeah. Praise God. We are currently kicking off this new series called Fully Known and Fully Loved. Um, as we're talking about the good news and what are the implications of the good news when it comes to the gospel and when it comes to Jesus Christ, um, really living and dying for our sin. And what, is the, what does it mean uh, that God um, knows us? So th that's where we're going to start today. We're going to look at this concept to be known. Uh, as we're walking through the scripture, we're actually going to look at some Old Testament verses. We're going to look at uh, some New Testament verses, and we're going to pull it all together around this ideal of what does it mean that God knows us? Uh, there's this, this um, feeling in our society that we actually want to be known and wants to be loved in a way that we are embraced um, more than ever. That's the reason why I really believe that we have so many different social media platforms, that we have so many different ways that People are putting their business out there on Facebook and because they, there's a part of us that wants to be known. But there's also a part of us that's afraid to be fully known. So, so as we're walking through scripture today, we're going to talk about how God um, uh, knows our hearts. He actually knows our mind. He actually knows who we are. And, and even in the midst of that, he fully loves us. And I think this is one of the things of the gospel that, that makes my heart filled with joy. So I want to share that excitement with you today as we're going through the text is that there's a reason why he, we can be fully loved only after we are fully known. So we're going to uh, unpack some of these verses and, um, and get right into it. So let us pray. Uh, and then after that, we're going to cover this concept to be fully known. Um, Heavenly Father God, we thank you, God, for being a gracious and loving God. Father God, we ask you, Pray for those who are uh, traveling the highways and, and out because um, they're not they're they're under the weather. God, we ask you, pray God that you God that you are a protector and a healer. That God that there's nothing outside of your reach that you cannot save nor restore. And so God, I ask you, pray God that as we're going to scripture today, God, that you be with us in this moment. Every single moment, every single reason. You have it already scripted out, God, because you know something that we need even when we don't know it. So, God, I ask you pray, God, as we're going through the text, let the text work on our hearts. Let this text encourage our faith. And, God, and let this text make us be willing to go boldly before you, God. God, I ask you pray that over these next four weeks, God, that those who have a relationship or who desire a relationship with God, might grow deeper in that relationship, might really understand what it means to be in a relationship with God and be known by God. So God, I actually pray, decrease me. Let there not see Justin or hear Justin. All they hear and feel is your love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going we're gonna to jump right into the text. We're going to jump right into um, Jeremiah. Um, um, there's this concept that's in this ideal is that I, I usually when I'm talking to people, they say this, God knows my heart. God knows me. God knows my heart. And, uh, and, and God is talking to Jeremiah in, in chapter 17. And this verse is always used uh, to understand the state of the heart of man. He, he actually says this in Jeremiah 17 and 9. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And we're going to talk about why um, the ESV calls it sick versus wicked with the King James. We're going to unpack that a little bit, but he asked the question, who can know it? And I, and, I, and I actually think this leads us to this idea of do we know, actually know what's inside of us? He, he, he actually makes this concept and he, he actually makes this understanding. Did he follow it back? Because he, what he's really trying to do is get you to understand that sometimes we don't even know what's inside of us. This is why when things happen, we are so embarrassed that it came out. We're like, whoa, where did that come from? Right? It's in your heart. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, there's a sickness that if you really don't understand that's there, you would treat the symptoms versus seeking the cure. And, and, and what God is saying is that there's a sickness that's in your heart. 
and you don't understand it. Then he follows it up in verse 10. He says this, I, the Lord, searches the heart and tests the mind. This is the understanding of this, this heart and this mind. He links them together in a way that whatever our hearts desire, our mind plots to figure out how to get it. And, and what he said is that, I search your heart, but yet I test your mind. To give every man according to his race, according to the fruits of his deeds. In the immediate context of this is chapter 17. What the writer is doing here is that he's leaning back to this concept of Judah. He's actually talking about Judah, uh, the Israel, uh, um, and, he's, and he's talking about their heart condition. And what he said in Judah chapter 17, verse 1, he said this, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. This is, this is this idea, what he's saying is that it put on their heart, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's locked in. He said, with a point of diamond, it is engraved on a tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altar. And, and exactly what he's painting the picture is that there's a, there's a sickness that's so ingrained in us that if we're not careful, we will go on living our lives and, and think that normal. And it's really this idea of what he's trying to unpack here is this idea of what this Hebrew word really is, is this incurable terminal disease. There's a disease that's in our hearts that we don't even know. And, and, um, and what God is really encouraging us of is that he knows the cure. We're going to talk about the cure in Jeremiah in a few minutes, but, but it's this idea, what he's saying is that the sin is, is, is so ingrained in you that sometimes we think the sin is us. It's, it's, it's so tied to what we call our flesh. It's so tied to what we call our life. That so much that even when someone corrects us of our sin, we take it so personal because it seems like it's an attack on us. This is the state of mankind. And it's, and it's not just, just one or two person, but it's the whole mankind. And this is why the gospel is so beautiful, is that God sees that we're sick. And we can, we, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to unpack uh, some Genesis and talk about sin and talk about why we need to be fully known. But today, what I want to talk about is this idea of that, what are the sins that he's talking about and how is he talking about how we get in this condition and what is the condition? So we're going to look at Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at uh, 29 to 32. And this is Paul talking about this concept of total depravity. What total depravity means is that we are so stuck in sin that we cannot save ourselves. And, uh, and like, this is what I said is that many times what we do is that we treat the, the symptoms, but we never seek the cure. What does that mean is that sometimes when we think we're we're bettering ourselves, what we're doing is that we're treating what, what bubbles to the surface. So if I got attitude, I'm going to treat, I'm going to say, I'm going to try not to get attitude no more. But there's something deeper and ruder in, in our heart. And what, and what Paul does here is that Paul is going to list out all of these symptoms. Symptoms. Symptoms of something that's deeper that's in our core, that's deeper that's in our lives. And what he's going to really paint in the, ch in the chapter of Romans, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not going to do a lot of context in Romans uh, because we did a whole series on it, but um, I'm going to try to paint the best picture of this concept of total depravity, of how far off we are from the heart of God, how far we are from the mind of God. He says this in, in 29. He said, they are filled with all matter of unrighteousness. He's talking about mankind. He said, unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy. Murder, strife, deceit, malicious intent. They are gospel, slanders, haters of God, isolate, insolence, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient, disobedient to appearance. Every time I read that, I'll be like, man, he threw disobedient to appearance right up there with murder. Like, that's, a, that's intense. Then he, <laughs> then he comes and he says, they're foolish. Not only are they disobedient to their parents, they're, they are foolish, faithless, heartless, 
ruthless. 32, though they know God righteous decrees that those who practice such things, they deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And like, this is what we see on TV, right? We all know that stuff ain't right, that we're watching and everything. He said, he said, not only are we just doing it, but we give approval. We, we, we actually say, oh, it's okay for you to do that. You, you know, you got that situation. And what God is saying is that that's not something that we do at our own will. It's just something that's built inside of us that is broken in a way that is, is twisted. It is set up in a way that it points back to ourselves for self-satisfying and dignity. I'm not saying that as, as people, we practicing every single sin that's on that list. Because that would be crazy. But total depravity does not mean that every person is as bad as he possibly can be. But that every person is completely consumed by a sin. A sin. Right? They're, 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 and and like, like this is why uh, I get so lost at churches that sometimes we treat one sin greater than another sin. But every, everyone in your heart, there is one sin that is dominant. And, and it, could be, it could be anywhere from lust to greed to pride. It's just consuming you. And it plays out in so many different ways. And, and, and what total depravity is saying is that no matter how you try to deal with that, it keeps bubbling up. It consumes you that there is no hope of turning it around and getting better on your own. We are totally and desperately wicked. And, and, and um, what the writer does, and I, and I actually think this is beautiful, is that the writer of Romans, Paul, he goes in chapter 3 and he talks about this a little bit more. He, he goes and he, he breaks out Romans chapter 3 and he says, then what then? Are we Jews any better off? Because what he does is that he talks about those that are in the world that um, if, you, if, if they look into the skies and they look into everything around them, they should be convicted in their heart to worship God, but they don't do it. Then he turns around and he said, these Jewish people um, have the written law. They have the, the word of God. And he asked, are those who go to church even better off? He said, no, not at all. Why? For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. See, he goes, he goes, he goes, the beautiful part is that, is this in the gospel is that just because I go to church and I know of God, doesn't mean I'm known of God. And I think that's a, 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 a disconnect in many churches and many churches in the rest is that we get so comfortable knowing facts about someone and don't even have a relationship. I have, I have watched people have conversations about celebrities like they know them. You don't know Will Smith. You're over there talking, man, 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 you don't know why he smacked that man. <laughs> he up there, right? You know, they, 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 they having these conversations and it's heated. You know what I'm saying? So much heated that we, we even fight people that we love at picnics <laughs> and cookout. You know what I'm saying? We're having these conversations like we know people who do not know us. And this is what the writer is painting this picture here is that sometimes we're having conversations about God and we're passionate about it. But we don't have a relationship with God. And how do we know that? We're going to talk about intimacy in a few minutes. He says, no, not all. They both are under sin. He said this, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God on their own. He goes in verse 12. He says this, all have turned aside and together have become worthless. No one do good, does good. Not even one. And this is the painting that he painted this, is that there's nothing inside your nature that wakes up and says, I want to give away all my money to the poor. There's nothing inside of you that instinctively wants to do that. 
And he says, he said, there's no one that's, that's inside of your nature that wants to, to um, just be a good person, right? This is why whenever you are in a tight crunch, unknowingly you go into survivor mode. I have to do whatever I need to do to survive. If that means I need to scratch, punch, whatever I need to do, I need to get my own. And what he's saying is that that's not the situation. That's the condition of your heart. He goes in verse 13, he says, their throats is an open grave. That means that everything they speak is of death. And they use their tongues to deceive. And the venom of ash is upon, uh, under their lips. He said, you got venom on your lips. Why? Verse 14, their mouths is full of curses and bitterness. Verse 15, their feet are swift to bloodshed. And in their path are ruins and ministry, misery. And the way of the peace they have not known. This is this ideal of what he's painting here is this. There's this idea in verse 18. He says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This ideal is that we live in a culture that doesn't fear God. Have no reverence for God. They actually don't even understand God. They, they just don't care. This is why people can do things that mock God. They can say things about Christianity that is very disrespectful because there's no fear. And one of the reasons why there's no fear is because us as a culture, we celebrate things that we should not be celebrating. There's no reason why the Shade Room is one of the top social media accounts. That all they do is talk about negativity and spirit gospel and, and talk and pick things apart. Why? Why do people run to stuff like that? Because there's something inside of us that love drama. They love to see misery. This is what the writer is saying. Why? If this was not true, Murray would not be on TV no more. <laughs> but they still plan it. Jerry Springer have been off the TV so long, but they still play the reruns. Why? People love it because it's something that's in our heart that's broken. This is why we love that juicy gossip when someone is messing up or, or when there's a scandal. We are, our ears that puck up, I want to know more. There's something wrong with the condition of our heart. And if we do not know, do anything, we would never be able to have a relationship and be known by God. This is why it is critical that we seek God with our everything. Why? Because in this body, there's no way we can have a relationship with God. No way outside of Jesus Christ. And this is why the writer said this in Romans 8. He says this about our flesh. He said, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's no way I could be a carnal Christian and, and live into the standard that God has for me to live to. Why? Because it's flesh. Its desires are in contrary to the desires of God. This is what he says in Romans 8. He, he paints this picture that the desires of what the flesh wants is, in, is actually in opposition with the desires that God wants to put in your heart. And fulfilling your heart. So if this is the state of our heart, how, how's God going to fix it? How he's going to cure this illness? This illness is, is actually referred to in many texts by Paul that he describes dead in sin. You are dead in sin. He actually says this in Ephesians 2 and, uh, 2 and 2, verse 1, Colossians 2, 13. This idea is that you're dead in sin. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we were at the X fellowship retreat, and I was talking to the guys uh, because they put us in the uh, separated women and the guys, and I'm talking to the guys, and I, I'm trying to paint this picture, is that if you're dead, how can you save yourself? If, if you are dead in sin, how can you save yourself? You can't. Someone has to 
bring, make you alive first to bring you into covenant. We're going to talk about how God initiates the relationship. He initiates the relationship. And like this is why we love drama, but we also love those romance comedy uh, movies that are like ridiculous. You, you know the movie I'm talking about. This guy, he messes up. And somehow he's, he's somewhere and, and they say, now you know the girl leaving on the plane. And I'll be like, they write the same movie over and over again. <laughs> and he say, she on the plane? And, and every time I, I see this, I say to myself, how long do it take for their, th that woman playing to take off? <laughs> because he instantly gets up. The woman not even thinking, he chases her to initiate. TSA, he gets you all on that <laughs> without a ticket. I don't know how. <laughs> but he gets to the woman to say, I want to reconcile. This is the thing that our hearts and our society long for. This is what Christ has done. This is how God says he's going to fix it in Jeremiah. We actually talked about, hey, he talked about the state of our hearts in Jeremiah. But he ends Jeremiah with the solution. He says this in Jeremiah 31, 33. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declare the Lord. Remember he said that sin is written on our hearts with our iron pen? I mean, it's, it's permanent ink. He said this, I will put my law within them, and I will write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is the beautiful thing. He says, he says, he says I know it's written on your heart, but I'm going to write on your heart too. I'm going to claim it to be what I've called it to be. And, and this is the ideal, is that it's the oldest of He said, I will be their God and they should be my people. We're going to be in relationships. We're going to be together. And this is the beautiful thing, is that no matter how far and how lost we feel that we got, God chases after us. He comes looking for us, looking to know you, for everything that you are. We're going to talk about why we need to be fully known in a few minutes. Um, uh, but he chases down. He says, I want you to be in a relationship with you. I want, I want to claim you. This is the ideal of, of in relationships is that, listen here, if, if like you in one of those relationships that you don't claim each other, that, that's, that's not a relationship. Right? I want to, I want to get that very clear is that to be in a relationship, I have to say, we are together. And this is the picture that he's painting. He said, I want everyone to know that you're mine and I'm yours. I'm not trying to do no secretness, no creeping on the low, <laughs> but I want to publicly make a declaration that you're my people and I'm your God. We are together. This is the beautiful part about being known. Is that God says, I know this person. This is why in Galatians he says this. Let's, let's, let's unpack Galatians. And, and, and this is really what touches my heart is this scripture alone. He says this, formerly when you did not know God, you was enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. He's talking about this idolatry in our hearts and how we worship like food, money, and things like this. This is why he used little g. He said we were enslaved to it. Our cravings of our hearts. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weakness and worthless elements and principles of this world who slave you to be once more. This is the beautiful thing. He said, he, um, uh, Paul does this beautiful thing that he says, but now you hear I came to know God. Then he said, oh, rather, hold on, wait. Be known by God. There, there's this ideal that not only do we know of God, but God seeks us out to have a relationship with him. 
This is why God wants you to pray. God wants you to pour out your heart to him. We actually look through the Psalms and we look through that. He wants to see you pour out all your emotions to him. Why? Because he already knows it's there. Why? We looked at um, Jeremiah 17, 10. He said, I searched your heart already. I know what's in your heart. Listen, he goes, the beautiful thing about being in a relationship with God is not like these phony dating. You know what I'm saying? Listen, everyone in the church is going to sit here and act like you don't know what it means, phony date. What phony date it means is that you talk about superficial things and you don't talk about real issues. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? I like pizza. I like purple. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like there come a point in your relationship that you have to be known. Right? But many times in dating, talking to my single folks here, we, we put on a facade. We become what we think the person wants in order for us to close the deal. And the problem with that, and, and, and the crazy part is that we watch these rom-com movies, and it tells us this. This person has this secret, and you're watching the movie, and this person falling in love with them, and they sit in there, and they're torn in their heart saying, I cannot tell them the secret. Because if I tell them the secret, they're going to leave. That person is saying, I can never be fully loved because I'm never fully known. But I'd rather take this, this superficial love versus gaining the true love. This is why our hearts break in those movies. Because when the sin bubbles up or the issue bubbles up, and they break up. The person who turned away from the person who messed up comes running back and says, because I fully know you, I could fully love you. And you sit there and you go, oh, can I, that's so beautiful. <laughs> Why? Our hearts wants to be able to say, I wake up, flaws and all. And you embrace it all. Every single mess up, Every single moment of confusion. Every single bubble up that I don't even know and I'm embarrassed about, you embrace it all. And you love it. You love it. That's the beauty of the gospel. Is that out of everyone in this church, the only person who knows me truly, not even Michelle, is God. God knows all my mess. He, like, knows my thoughts. He, like, knows when something happened and someone do something silly and I say something in my mind and he say, Justin, that's not right. <laughs> I'm letting y'all know I turned on the Olympics and they was break dancing and a whole bunch of stuff went through my mind. <laughs> they, I'm like, oh, that's not right, Justin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? And, it, and it's one of those things is that I, I could call him my best friend because he sees the the good, but you also see the darkness in my heart some days. And the beauty of the gospel is that he don't sit there and say, ugh, how dare you do that? He says, Justin, why are you doing that? You could be so much more. Why would you sell yourself to be cheap with that? Why would you entertain those type of thoughts? Because he actually sees who I was designed to be. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's that no matter how dirty I am, no matter how broken I am, he says, my grace is enough. It's more than sufficient. It can overcome and restore you and bring you to the fullness of who I love. You can only be fully loved when you're fully known. This is why the devil makes you try to cover it up. Because in hiding Bring distance. Mm. Help me, Holy Spirit. Let me break this down. And secrets bring distance. Listen here. You don't want no relationships that got secrets. I'm talking to my, my young kids here. You don't want no relationships that got secrets. Because secrets locks me up to a place where I cannot be connected to no one else. 
Because I have to keep it in my heart. I can't tell nobody. So I'm distant from you. Even though I'm close, I'm distant from you. How did God do this? He actually comes to Adam and Eve and he, and he, and he puts a sequence in there. Listen, listen, I like know God says this, but what he really trying to do, he's trying to do this thing with you. And if you do this, you're going to get this. And they believe the lie. And once they believe the lie, but the Bible said their eyes was open. And what they did was they covered themselves in fig leaves. They hid themselves. They became secret. We're going to cover in a couple of weeks on how we can go boldly before the throne of God. But, but, but they, they hid themselves. The secrecy made distance from God. And God said, I don't like that. I don't like how you got something on your mind, but you won't say it out loud. I don't like how when I came looking for you, I couldn't find you. I called your phone and you didn't answer. You like got a phone now and you never had a passcode on your phone but now you got a passcode on your phone. I'm, I'm talking about secrecy. Of how the enemy start making someone hide things that destroys the relationship. And what God says, I want to be fully known. I'm an open book. This is why when the, the, um, Jesus told his disciples, he says, Call me master no longer. Why? Because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but calls me friend. This is a beautiful part is that he wants you to know what's going on, how he's moving, how he's navigating. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But some things, I'm, 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 I'm going to be transparent here. God likes surprises. And and like some days, I'd be like, God, what you doing? He'd be like, just wait. You're going to find out. Soon, it will all make sense. We're going to look at some verses that say that. But he said this. But listen to this. I'm going to always reveal to you everything. That's the beauty of God's heart. He, he don't want to keep nothing from you. So whenever the enemy comes and say, Man, God's trying to keep that from you. You can rebuke that and say, the devil is a liar. Because he fully know me and he's making himself fully known to me. So if anything he's, he's keeping quiet, it's only because it's a surprise of something better. This is how he's saying, I want to be in a relationship with you. So, so what's the challenge? How do we get in this relationship with you? We have to act in love. We have to act in love. Let's, let's look at 1 John and, and just unpack some of these. Before we go to 1 John, let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, no, we go to 1 John. Yeah, let's go to 1 John 3, 4, 5, 8, 10. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole, whole Bible. Um, when I first started um, preparing for ministry, I, I wrote this on my wall because this is a staple of our hearts. He said this, little children, let us not love in words or in talk, but in deeds and truth. And, I, and, the, and the reason why I love this verse is that he calls you out. He says, I don't want to hear you just talking about you're a good person. I, don't, I need you to start living that life. You know what I'm don't talk about it be about it, right? That was one of those sayings in the 90s. Don't talk about it, be about it, right? This is really what it comes, this concept is that let it not just your love be in words and talk, but show me some actions. And this, and this, he, he did come to that, he says this in verse 19, as we're still going there, he said, by this we shall know that we are of truth. And we are sure our hearts is before him. We, we're actually talking about this. How, how do I know that I am being fully known before God? I am fully living my life completely. I'm not just talking love, I'm living love. I'm not just using words about love and beautiful language, but I'm doing deeds and I'm living in truth. I'm not lying about things. I'm, I, I, 
I try to be as honest as possible, right? You know what I'm saying? This is why I always prefix when I'm getting ready to say something hard to someone that they know that it's my heart and my intention to be truthful. They say, Justin, do you like my food? And be like, to be honest, <laughs> I really wasn't feeling it, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right, right, you know what I'm saying? Why? Because I want to live in truth. I like, don't want to be just saying things just to be saying things because the more you lie, the distance you get from the heart of God. So the goal is for us to live in truth. He says, by this we know and we are of truth and we assure our heart is before him. When we live in that way, he goes on in verse 20, he says this, for wherever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. This is the beautiful thing about it, right? There are some times in our lives where we get in situations that we just feel bad and we feel like, oh man, I shouldn't did that. Man, I, I, know, I know God is disappointing with us. And our hearts start to do the condemning. He said, guess what? God is greater than your heart. He said, God knows everything. And what God says is that I'm able to forgive. And, and sometimes we live in a life where we do stuff that we cannot forgive ourselves. Let's just be honest here. There's times where we have done stuff and we have failed ourselves. And we say, I, God, I'm stupid. How did I do that? Oh, I love you. And we're having a hard time forgiving ourselves. But God says, I still love you in that situation. Even if your heart is condemning you, listen here, I'm greater than your heart. This is why we have to look to the rock greater than I. Because he knows everything. He knows everything. And even in that knowing, it does not change his love for you. He don't love you no less because he loves you completely. This is the beautiful thing about it, that he, his love does not change. You know what I'm saying? There are some people, you would say some stuff and like, they'll say they cool, but you're going to see some changes. <laughs> For example, if like someone was to come to me and say, Justin, we cool? I'm like, yeah, we cool. And they'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm like still... I'm still struggling with stealing. I'm going to grab my phone, say, yeah, we cool. Put it in my pocket, I'm, I'm, I'm check my wallet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Why? Why? Because in my human nature, I want to control. But in God, you say, God, I still struggle with stealing. He takes the wallet out and put it on the table. And say, listen here, you don't have to steal, you just got to ask. That's the beauty of the relationship with God. Is that there's nothing that we cannot have. All we have to do is ask. He goes on in verse 21. He said, beloved, if our hearts does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We have confidence because if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence in the God. This is what I'm talking about, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. This is the beautiful thing. This is what I'm saying is that, is that, is that sometimes we say, God, I'm struggling with this. And, and, and in my struggling, I want to do this to get it. And he says, you don't have to do that. Because in me, I can fulfill everything that you need. You don't have to go outside the God to get anything. And this is the confidence that we have, that if we live our lives in a way that we're not condemning our hearts and, our, and we're not living in shame, we have confidence before God. I go to God and I can be like, God, you know, I want to punch this dude in the face. Why do I want to pray like that? Because I got confidence that he already know I'm feeling that way. He already know I'm heated. 
He already know what I want to do with my mouth. So I pour my heart out before him. And in, in his presence, he fulfilled what I need. There's something in our hearts that we don't want to treat the symptoms we want to cure. God is the only one that can fix it. He's the only one that can fix it. So he says this, because we keep his commandments and do what please him. What is his commandments? Let's look at 23. He says this, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has commanded. Me loving God and me loving people. I'm doing the work of God. I'm doing the work of God. And, and, and this is why we have to pray all the time. God, increase my capacity to love you more and to love people more. This is why I think the writer in, in Paul wrote in Ephesians, he wrote this in 3.14. He said, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named that according to the riches of his glory that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why? Because it's in my heart that I'm fighting the war many times. It's in my mind where I need help and backup. So that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith. Where do I need God? I need God in my heart. How do he get there? Through my faith in him. That you being rooted and grounded in love. We have to be rooted and grounded in God's love so that we maybe have the ability to love others. That's why he goes in verse 18, he said this, may have the strength to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. This is what, how he says this. When I am living my life and I'm grounded in love, once I'm fully known and I'm asking and I'm confident before God and I'm fully loved, once I'm living like that, I then can comprehend with other people. Many times we're trying to start relationships with others before we have a right relationship with God. And it's catastrophic. He actually goes and he then he says that I will, I'll be able to comprehend with them, but yet I will going to know. I'm going to know the love of Christ. I'm going to know that he loves me. How much? That I can't even comprehend it, but I'm going to know it. It's going to surpass my understanding, but I'm somehow going to grasp it. How much do you love me? To the moon and back. That's why I used to tell my mama, how much do you love me? Mama, to the moon and back. <laughs> right? We used to say things like that. But with God, he said, how much do you love me? I love you to infinity and beyond. This is why in our relationship, we're never not full with his love. No matter how much you grow, he will fill you up to the fullness of God. Because it's so much that he only gives you what you can hold today. And he keeps the rest, not for himself, but for when you need it in the future. You will never run out the love of God. You will never run out of the love of God. It's a love that surpasses your knowledge, but you need to know what you know today. This is why he answered with this. He said that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's only when you in the love of God that you feel full. And I'm going to end with this. I'm going I'm to end with this story. I remember um, I have a sugar tooth. I already had one when I was a kid, but I remember this 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 vivid um, thing that I wanted to eat pancake syrup 
with some Kool-Aid. <laughs> Don't judge me. I'm from the hood, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? So, so I'm a little kid. I had to be around dollar age, and I remember I was eating the pancakes, and I was like, ooh, I'm going to go get some Kool-Aid because that's going to be street too. And, and I went and drank the Kool-Aid, and the Kool-Aid was not sweet. But I know that Kool-Aid was sweet. Why can I taste the sweetness? I, I asked my mom, I said, Mom, why the Kool-Aid not sweet? Something wrong with the Kool-Aid. She said, nah, baby. Your sweet buds are full of the syrup. It has no capacity for the Kool-Aid. This is how our life works with God, is that when we fool off with God, we don't got no capacity for mess. We don't got no capacity for junk. We don't got no capacity for... That. It's, it's almost numb to us because we fool off the fullness of Christ. So, as we are going through this, I'm going to talk about love next week. We're going to really unpack this concept of knowing the love of God. But... To be known is one of the most beautiful things. To walk out here and say, man, God know all my mess. And he still loves me. You know what I'm saying? I might lie to y'all, but I don't never got to lie to him. He knows me. But yet he loves me. That's to give you a boldness to come to him and say, God, why do you love me such as this? And live a changed life. So I want to pray as we're wrapping up. This ideal is that as, as we are going out here and we're being known, that it brings confidence. I think that's one of the biggest things about Christianity is that we should walk with confidence. We walk with our heads up. Don't walk in shame. Don't walk with trying to hide things. I'm, I'm telling you guys this, that as I grow in Christ, the more bolder I become. So much that I be saying things out loud that I used to get embarrassed of, but I don't even care no more. Because God knows it, and if God's cool with it, I don't care what you think, right? <laughs> right? And that's, and that's this confidence that comes with you, is that I start living for Christ and Christ alone. I'm not trying to impress nobody. The only person I'm trying to impress is God. So, I want to pray that we all get to this point. That we're no longer trying to live for the Joneses, but we're trying to live for God. We're like not trying to win someone approval, but we're trying to live for God. Because he's the only one that fully knows us and the only one that can, is willing to fully love us with everything. So, let us pray so God can move on us now. Heavenly Father, God, we ask you to pray right now, God. God, we come with our hearts open to you, God. Everything, everything that we did this week, everything that we're thinking about, anything that we're hiding, we come to you in this moment, God, and God, we lay it at the altar. Everything. Everything. The failures, the hurt, the shame, the moments of embarrassment that we still haven't told anybody what happened that day. But you know. You actually know why we was crying and why we was upset, and no one understands that day but you was there. You actually seen how we messed up. And although we have recovered over the time, the pain is still there. The embarrassment is still in the moment. And we think we heal, but something always triggers it, God. And today is the day, God, that we come with our arms open and our hearts open. And God, we say, it's all yours. 
We're not hiding any more mess. The devil is not going to wave or blackmail us with anything else because you know it already. So God, we come with our hearts and we want to say that we're sorry. We're sorry. Sorry for thinking that we can hide secrets from you and, and thinking that this is going to change you. We're sorry for thinking that our sin is so great that you don't have the capacity to understand it, that it will make you turn your face from us. But yet in this moment, we realize it draws you closer to us. Oh, what type of love is this? He got a, he got a simple thing I thought you was going to act differently and you draw near closer because in this moment we're resisting the devil and we draw near unto God with it all so God I pray God that we have no shame God that God is just sin in our lives that we always pour it out before you God and talk to you honestly about it and God that you give us the strength and the ability to do your will. God, I'm praying, God. I'm crying out for myself, but I'm also crying out for my brothers and sisters. We want to do the things that pleases you, God. So God, help our unbelief in the times where we think you don't care. Let us rebuke that moment and say, my God cares about it all. He cares so much about us that he knows that the number of the hairs on my hair, my head, he knows me deeply. So there's nothing I have to hide. So God, I pray that as we're going through our week, that this confidence of being known by you and loved by you penetrate our lives. Make us not think that we're not good enough for something. But let us know that, God, you see value even when we don't see value because you're greater and you love us as you love us, as you designed to love us. So, God, I just pray right now, God, Give us strength. Give us wisdom. But give us boldness to go forth and do exactly what you have called us to do. Because lo, you are with us always to the ends of the earth. So God, I pray, give us this wisdom. Give us this knowledge but ingrain us and root and ground us in your love. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. 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 I love you guys, and I hope to see everyone next week. All right. God bless. If anyone wants prayer, I'll be up here to pray.